Thank you for the introduction, Nithya. I'm very honored to share with you all a very exciting project that I worked on in the past year. This project is on the external evaluation of a prior model, as well as the development of a simplified population PK model for factor E in the adult hemophilia patients who are undergoing surgeries at the University of North Carolina Medical Center. Like Nithya mentioned, I just started the fourth year of my PhD journey, and here is my contact information for your reference. I have nothing to disclose. The overall project is aimed at optimizing PRA operative factor eight dosing regimen in adult patients with hemophilia A in the US. The objectives for today's presentation are twofold. One is to externally evaluate a previously published population PK model in an independent patient cohort at UNC, and two, to develop a simplified population PK model for the UNC patients undergoing surgeries. First, let me walk you through the disease pathophysiology. Hemophilia is a bleeding disorder that slows the blood clotting process or patients experience inability to clot. More specifically, hemophilia A is an X-linked inheritance and it's caused by a qualitative or quantitative deficiency in factor VIII, which results in chronic spontaneous bleeding events. Now for patients with moderate to severe factor VIII deficiency, the spontaneous bleeding can impose hemostatic challenges in surgeries and can also cause life-threatening events, such as intracranial hemorrhaging. Hemophilia A treatment predominantly consists of factor VIII replacement therapy as acute prophylactic and a perioperative indication. However, the current factory replacement therapy is weight-based and doesn't account for white inter-individual PK variability, and that can lead to suboptimal concentrations of factor VIII, resulting in bleeding or impaired wound healing. Even though hemophilia A only affects a small number of patients, with a high cost of the replacement therapy, it was estimated that the mean healthcare cost of one patient was $150,000 a year. Now, with the indirect cost of underemployment due to the improper treatment of hemophilia A, the total cost can amount to $4 million per patient a year. Therefore, there is an urgent public health need to optimize factor VIII dosing to not only provide safe and effective dose for patients, but also to reduce the overall healthcare expenditures in the long run. In 2016, Hazen Donk et al. from the Netherlands published the first population PK model that described the period operative PK of factor VIII. It was a 2001 model incorporating weight, age, blood type, surgical severity on clearance, and body weight and age on volume and distribution. We aim to externally evaluate this model for its suitability of an extrapolation to a U.S. population. And if the extrapolation was deemed inappropriate, we aim to develop our own perioperative factor VIII model for the adult hemophilia A patients in the U.S. Briefly, these aims are accomplished through the process of data collection, external evaluation, and lastly, the US UNC model development. First, an IRB approval was obtained and a retrospective chart review was conducted to identify eligible patients. The inclusion criteria were adult patients between the age of 18 to 79 years old underwent surgery at UNC between April 2014 and November 2019 and were treated with factor VIII concentrates perioperatively. Patient information on age, weight, blood type, factor VIII doses, and factor VIII plasma concentrations were extracted from the UNC electronic medical records. For the external evaluation, the data set was fitted using either the original model where the original model with three estimated parameters, and then bootstrapped 1,000 times. The Guinness of Fit diagnostic plot was used to evaluate model bias. Lastly, for the UNC model development, covariate effects were evaluated, and then the prior population PK model was simplified to fit the UNC patient data. The fitted results are presented with a prediction corrected VPC plot. Here I present to you the demographic information of the patient included at UNC. A total of 35 patients with 521 factor VIII concentrations were available for PK analysis. In comparison to the demographic information of the Hazen Donk model, the major differences were that the UNC study only included adult patients, 
whereas the Hazen Dunk study enrolled 44 children in addition to 75 adult patients. Additionally, less than half of the UNC patients were blood type O, yet about half of the patients from the Hazen Dunk group were blood type O. The other demographic information, such as age, weight, surgical procedures, were comparable between the two studies. The bootstrap results are shown here. This is a busy table, so let me first orient you. All of the parameters included in the Hazendonk model are listed in the left column. The Hazendonk estimates for these parameters were listed in the middle column. And the parameter estimates after UNC data being refitted to the original model are shown on the right. One takeaway from the table is that the covariate effect of blood type on clearance surgical type on clearance, and age on volume and distribution cross the threshold of no effect. And this could potentially be attributed to the fact that our data set doesn't have enough patients to evaluate a large number of parameters that were part of the Hazendonk model. Overall, the external evaluation showed significant bias and a trend for overestimating factor rate levels, suggesting some structural misspecification. And for this reason, we proceeded to develop a simplified population PK model to describe the UNC patient data. For the base model development, we observed that fewer parameters improved the overall fit, and this was evidenced by a slight reduction in the deviation of the observed versus predicted factor eight ratio from the line of unity. And in terms of covariate selection, we first examined the relationship between each of the covariate effects versus the inter-individual variability, or ADA, of both clearance and the volume of distribution. The graphs shown here are an example of the covariate effects against the ADA of clearance. The left four graphs reflect the categorical covariates, whereas the six graphs on the right reflect the continuous covariates. Subsequently, we performed a stepwise covariate search to identify not only statistically significant, but also clinically relevant covariates to be included in the final model. The UNC final model is a one-compartment model with a compartmental reset at the start of each dosing PK sampling occasion. The inter-individual variability of clearance is explained by patients' weight, age, and the factory product type, and the weight explains that of volume of distribution. As seen from the graph on the right, the UNC model has an adequate goodness of fit diagnostic plot. The most right figure represents the prediction corrected VPC of the final UNC model, which shows that most of the points fell within 80% prediction interval and that the prediction is consistent with the observed data. In conclusion, although the Hazendonk model served as an initial framework, the external evaluation revealed that some covariates, such as blood type and surgical severity, were not significant in the UNC patient population. And this could be attributed to the demographic differences in a small data set that is part of the UNC patient cohort. As a next step, we plan on leveraging this new UNC model to simulate novel factor eight dosing regimen for patients C and UNC and evaluating the model's capability for use in therapeutic drug monitoring. Overall, these data provide rationale to continue lines of uh, research inquiry aimed at tailoring factor eight perioperative dosing regimen to each hemophilia A patient using the population PK methods. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge the following collaborators and colleagues. I want to give a big shout out to Dr. Shirley Liu, who's my co-first author on this project. Her talent and dedicated effort in modeling and simulation was indispensable. I also would like to thank our collaborators from the Netherlands who have given us tremendous help in terms of modeling support. Additionally, I want to thank all of the funding sources and all patients enrolled in the study. Without you, we wouldn't be able to make advancement towards better patient care. And thank you all for listening. Um, now I'd like to open up the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Nithya, for your kind introduction. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here virtually to attend my presentation focused on quantitative evaluation of levonorgestrel efficacy in drug-drug interaction scenarios. Let me give you a brief overview of what the study is and what the study has. Hormonal contraceptive agents are widely used to prevent and in 
unintended pregnancies. And while coming to its failure rates, it is 1 to 2% in FSD trials. However, when it goes to general population, it is close to 9%. And among several factors, obesity and drug-drug interactions play a major role, uh, contributing to this increased failure rates. And what the study adds, uh, we came up with a dose-response relationship for levonorgestrel containing uh, hormonal contraceptives and evaluated the combined impact of DDI and obesity on efficacy, that is, pregnancy rates. And if at all, there could be any dose adjustments that could be done in these scenarios. And also, uh, yeah, whether or not uh, the drug class label guidance of FDA can be generalized to all hormonal contraceptives or not. So why is this so complex or uh, ch more challenging to study here is uh, we have levonorgestrel uh, that primarily binds to uh, say uh, SHBG that is sex hormone binding globulin and levonorgestrel is frequently found, uh, frequently found in combination with estrogen component that is uh, ethanyl estradiol. So ethanyl estradiol also stimulates SHBG levels. And on top of that, uh, we have when we uh, when we have obesity, uh, that would also uh, say uh, kind of decrease the SHBG levels, uh, making this even more complex. Uh, when uh, we have uh, a kind of certain per perpetrator such as uh, rifampicin, which is a strong CYP3A4 inducer, a major metabolizing enzyme for levonorgestrel, it also uh, kind of uh, increases the SHBG levels. Considering these uh, multiple factors affecting the LNG exposure, it makes, a, it makes it a bit challenging to see how would that impact the efficacy, that is pregnancy rates. So in order to study this, uh, this project has been funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and collaborated, by, uh, collaborated between uh, uh, Bayer Pharmaceuticals, uh, University of North Texas, and as well as uh, University of Florida. So uh, we have here two major pillars. One is PBPK pillar that gives us uh, changes in exposure of levonorgestrel uh, in case of DDI and in the different subpopulations of our interest. And we have MBMA pillar where we came up with a dose response model. And once we have these two, when we integrate, uh, we would get how would the Perl index that is uh, a, an efficacy endpoint uh, would change in case of this DDI scenarios in different subpopulations. So Perl index can be defined as uh, uh, how many number of pregnancies that would occur in 100 women years of use. So let's start with uh, the dose response model. So uh, we have uh, here the y-axis, uh, the Perl index and the x-axis as LNG dose. And uh, the dots represent the observations from the literature and the solid line represents, represents the mean predicted uh, uh, Perl index uh, with uh, across various doses of levonorgestrel uh, coming from the IMAX model, which we have developed. As you can see, most of the doses that we have are uh, at the higher dose range between 90, 100, and 150 micrograms. And uh, on top of the once we had this dose response model, the other interesting question which we had was what would be the threshold levels of levonorgestrel that would be required to maintain this efficacy? So in order to do that, based on different literature sources, we came up with three cutoff values for Perl index, that is pregnancy rates here. So we came up with two, three, and five. So once we, since we have the dose response model developed, we calculated what doses of levonorgestrel would give these uh, uh, Perl index. And once we have these doses calculated, we inputted these doses into the PBPK model of levonorgestrel and simulated until steady state and see uh, what would be the trough levels of levonorgestrel in the plasma. So what we see here is uh, uh, a trough uh, steady state levels of levonorgestrel between 192 and 295 nanogram per liter uh, would be required to maintain the efficacy of levonorgestrel, uh, that is Perl index between two to three. And once you are below 112 nanogram per liter, the Perl index would be greater than five, which is the upper uh, bound of uh, kind of cutoff value, which we have selected. So uh, can, can, if you see the uh, dose response relationship, uh, if you have any user uh, uh, on this dose or uh, when you're taking at this dose, uh, uh, you need to go towards the left of this curve that would kind of uh, decrease the efficacy and uh, 
uh, where uh, the Perl index will be increased. So once we had this uh, dose response model developed, uh, we evaluated different clinical DDI simulations using uh, uh, the PBPK models of uh, L11 orgestral and ethanol estradiol we have developed in two different doses, uh, that is LNG100 and LNG150 with EE combinations, and also LNG alone administration as well in healthy and obese women. So in, uh, uh, we have a co-administered with cyp 4 inhibitors and cyp 4 inducers. Uh, once we did the DDI simulations, we calculated the full changes in AUC and converted to LNG doses. And these are the doses that has been inputted into the uh, dose response model to see how would the pearl index has been changed in case of these DDI scenarios. Here, uh, what we saw was, uh, let's start with the exposure, uh, and uh, heaven on crystal exposure was uh, lower in, in obese women compared to normal uh, BMI women. So let's start with uh, a, a contraceptive alone administration. Towards the left, this is total levonorgestrel, and towards the right, what we see is unborn levonorgestrel. And without any perpetrator itself, uh, the levonorgestrel exposure in obese men represented by triangles is uh, 25 to 50% lower compared to normal BMI women. And, uh, and on top of that, if you have any user, uh, the decrease in exposure is even more prominent in obese women uh, compared to normal, normal BMI women. So, and uh, coming to the other uh, side of this, where we have an inhibitor, there is an increase in LNG exposure uh, close to twofold in normal BMI women, uh, while in case of a uh, uh, basement, there are like minor increases. And coming to unbound uh, levonorgestrel, uh, there were like uh, very minor differences uh, uh, between uh, uh, healthy uh, weight and uh, obese women but there are like uh, some differences in case of a uh, uh, couple of inhibitor scenarios. So for the dose response relationship, uh, we have used uh, total level nodestral to link from the PBPK to uh, MBMA pillar. So once, uh, as I said, uh, we have the exposure changes from the PPPK pillar and we have uh, the dose response relationship from the MBMA pillar. So when we integrated this, what we found was, again, let's start with uh, contraceptive alone. Uh, in this case, yeah, as you can see, the pearl index for uh, obese men represented by triangles uh, is uh, uh, a kind of uh, the pregnancy rate is doubled uh, compared to normal uh, weight, uh, normal weight women. And uh, here on top of that, if you have any strong CYP3 or inducers, uh, the pearl index has been increased uh, between three to five, uh, which is uh, close to the upper bound of uh, the cut upper cutoff value, uh, as you can see as a red dotted line here in case of obese men while coming to normal women, uh, there is again, uh, compared to the baseline, uh, there is definitely a, say 1.52 to fold increases in the pearl index. And in case of inhibitors, uh, since there is an increase in exposure, obviously we would see a decreased, uh, uh, say, uh, pearl index that is increased efficacy. So uh, considering all these scenarios, uh, what we found was uh, the total and uh, free LNG exposure decreased by 50 to 75 percent uh, with the strong CYP3 or inducers. Uh, and these scenario DDIs uh, would increase the risk of one in intended pregnancies for levonorgestrel containing hormonal contraceptive pills. And this risk is even further increased in case of obese women who are taking the CYP3 or inducers. Uh, based on our analysis, uh, we would suggest uh, one might require a backup or alternative methods of contraception in the presence of inducers. And uh, uh, further, uh, we would like to expand and this quantitative framework to other progestins to determine if uh, what we found in case of levonorgestrel is generally applicable to all other different progestin containing hormonal contraceptives or not. With that, uh, I would like to thank uh, my professor, my advisor, uh, Dr. Stefan Schmidt, and also all the collaborators who have uh, given enormous input into this uh, in the, into this project. With that, I would like to thank everyone and I'm open for a Q&A.
Thank you, Nikia, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Brooke, and today I'm going to be presenting how well the adult-to-children pharmacokinetics extrapolation works for monoclonal antibodies. The importance of pharmacokinetic data in pediatric drug development is well recognized, and a pediatric pharmacokinetic study is generally recommended before pivotal pediatric trials to ensure that the right dose is used in these studies. Here you can see the FDA pediatric decision tree, and as you can see, all options do currently require PK studies if no historical data is available. From that decision tree, the question arises of what if there is a sufficient understanding of pediatric PKs and a robust mechanism to extrapolate them from adult data? In the case of monoclonal antibodies, the PK is largely affected by body weight. Therefore, particularly in monoclonal antibodies with linear PKs, the PK behavior in pediatrics aged 2 to 17 years is thought to be predictable based on adult data through allometric extrapolation. In cases where this is true, a dedicated pediatric PK may not be necessary. However, no systematic investigation has been performed. We divided this project into two research questions. Question one, would the standard allometry exponents of 0.75 for clearance and one for volume provide sufficient PK extrapolation from adults to children? And question two, can empirical body size-based dosing regimens be identified using PK simulation? In order to investigate the possibility of allometric extrapolation, five case studies were used. Each case study had an adult model and corresponding pediatric study observations. As you can see, the route of administration used in three of the case studies was intravenous, whereas the other two were administered subcutaneously. For each study, a population PK model was developed based on the adult data. Clearance and volume were scaled allometrically based on weight using a power model. The allometric exponential values for weight on clearance and weight on volume were chosen according to one of two approaches. In approach one, we used the allometric exponents found in the adult model. In approach two, the exponential values were the standard accepted values of 0.75 for clearance and one for volume. A literature review of exponents used in monoclonal antibody models found that the value was close to 0.75 for clearance, it was 0.72, and lower than one for volume, it was 0.68, but still within the range. These two approaches were used to simulate pediatric PK profiles using subjects randomly sampled from the corresponding age brackets of the CDC database. Here you can see the observed pediatric data superimposed on simulated runs for monoclonal antibody 3. To assess the accuracy of the model predictions, the simulated pediatric trough and peak concentrations were compared to the actual PK observations from the corresponding trials. Here you can see a ratio of the predicted to observed trough, trough concentrations uh, delimited by age within each approach. For pediatrics aged 6 to 17 years, both approaches had comparable performances. The predicted trough concentrations were within 0.67 to 1.5 fold of the observed PK values in most cases. There was an overall trend of underprediction in both models. For children less than 6 years old, no definite conclusion could be made as there uh, were data limitations. Trough comparison values were selected based on steady state or end of induction or data availability. Similarly, here you can see the peak concentrations taken from post-infusion values for IV trials or Tmax values for subcutaneous trials. When comparing the predicted to observed ratios for the peak concentrations, the adult model trended similarly towards underprediction, whereas the standard allometric model performed better. Here I show a summary of the two approaches at the aforementioned time point. Importantly, model performance was overall comparable using the two extrapolation approaches. The predicted trough and peak concentrations were within 0.67 and 1.5 fold of the observed PK values in most cases. This brings us to the second research question, exploring empirical dosing approaches of monoclonal antibodies. For monoclonal antibodies with a linear PK, previous works have suggested a weight threshold greater than or equal to 40 kilograms for pediatric subjects to receive the adult dose. We use simulations in order to explore the empirical body size based dosing regimens for children less than 40 kilograms by matching the exposures in pediatrics to those of adults with sensitivity analysis and validation. Simulations using a set of typical monoclonal antibody parameters uh, shown here in the model section 
were performed. The standard allometric exponential values were again used in a power model to simulate the subjects. Adult and pediatric subjects were randomly sampled from pooled data sets of the five case studies and the CDC database, respectively. Two forms of body size-based dosing were explored, dosing by weight and dosing by BSA. In each case, systematic exposure metrics of steady state trough concentrations and AUC during dosing interval were computed from the simulated PK profiles. The resulting trough concentrations and AUC in pediatric subjects were compared to the simulated results in adults and the results in pediatrics greater than 40 kilograms. Adjacent weight buckets with sufficiently similar exposures were combined to create larger weight buckets. Adjustment factors were then assigned to each weight bucket when needed to match the exposure to adults. Pediatric subjects were dosed using the following formula. Adult dose divided by 60 kilograms times the subject's body weight times an adjustment factor. 60 kilograms was selected as a reference weight as it is close to the mean and median body weight for pediatric subjects greater than 40 kilograms in the CDC pediatric database. Prior to adjustment, low-weight pediatric subjects were significantly underdosed. Therefore, an adjustment factor of 1.5 was chosen for pediatrics less than 20 kilograms, and an adjustment factor of 1.1 was used for patients 20 to 40 kilograms to provide acceptable exposure. You can see the final trough comparisons broken down by weight and broken down by age here. The steady state AUC pediatric to adult ratio using the selected adjustment factors was also considered. You can see the results again grouped by weight and age here. This process was again repeated for BSA based dosing with the same weight bucket selected. When dosing by BSA, pediatric subjects were dosed using the following formula. Adult dose divided by 1.67 times subject BSA times an adjustment factor. In this case, 1.67 BSA was chosen as the average BSA corresponding to the weight of 60 kilograms. For BSA-based dosing, it was determined that no adjustment factor was needed. You can see the pediatric to adult steady state trough ratios grouped by weight here and grouped by age here. You can see that they were all within the range. The steady state AUC pediatric to adult ratio was also considered. You can see the results again grouped by age and weight here. Again, note that they were fairly within range. You can see the results of each empirical dosing method after applying the adjustment factors here. Our data, as shown, supports that pediatric subjects greater than 40 kilograms can generally receive the adult dose. The simulated exposure difference between adults and children greater than 40 kilograms was less than uh, plus or minus 20 percent and therefore considered clinically insignificant. For children less than 40 kilograms, BSA-based dosing may provide exposure comparable to adults, whereas additional adjustment factors are needed using weight-based dosing to avoid underexposure in children with low body weight. You can see the percent difference after the adjustment factors in this column right here. In conclusion, our work supports that the pediatric PKs of uh, subjects aged 6 to 17 years is readily predictable based on adult PK data for monoclonal antibodies with linear PKs. It also proposed empirical dosing calculations to be used in converting adult doses to the equivalent pediatric doses. I do want to quickly note that the extrapolation uh, performance assessment findings were based on the data from several uh, monoclonal antibodies, and they would need further validation with more data specifically for that less than 6 year, uh, years old age group. Additionally, empirical dosing extrapolations were based on simulations using standard allometry and assuming a linear PK. Modifications may be needed uh, depending on the compound or the specific PK behavior. I would like to briefly thank the Janssen Clinical Pharmacology and Pharmacometrics Summer Intern Program and the other authors on this paper, um, as well as the people on the Clinical Pharmacology team for making this project possible and for all of their help along the way, it was really appreciated. A special thank you to Yan Shu for all of her amazing guidance and help on this project and for being a wonderful mentor. Thank you, and I'll take any questions at this time. So thank you very much, Nithya, for the kind introduction. And I would also like to um, express my gratitude for the opportunity to speak here today in the setting and present my research poster with the title Predictive Performance of a Novel In Vitro Dissolution Setup for Nasal Suspensions Development and Validation 
for a level A in vitro in vivo correlation. For the assessment of nasal suspension, an array of in vitro tests are described, but at this point, dissolution testing is not playing a major role. Um, if you take a look at uh, the figure one on the right-hand side, this is a summary of the in vitro methods that are described in order to assess bioequivalency of uh, nasal spray uh, formulations. In this list, you will not find any dissolution testing. And while for solid oral dosage forms, it is common practice to test the solution behavior, for nasal spray formulation, a standardized in vitro dissolution method has yet to be developed. And that is although the solution rate is crucial for nasal targeting. And let me give you two examples. Um, if you have a nasal suspension with slow dissolution, then solid particles that deposit in the nasal mucosa are subject to something called uh, mucociliary clearance. This is a process that removes drug from the target site, which consequently, of course, leads to less therapeutic effect. And then on the other hand, if the nasal spray dissolution is too fast, then there is increased risk of more dissolved particles entering the systemic circulation, which then leads to uh, more side effects. And this is why the knowledge of the dissolution behavior also of suspension-based nasal sprays is of relevance for the development of innovative products as well as generic formulation. And the objective is, um, the objective was that we developed a, a novel in vitro dissolution setup for nasal suspensions. And the scope of today's work is to establish a quantitative relationship between the in vitro dissolution with the new setup and the in vivo absorption in the nose. On this slide, um, it's a graphical representation of our experimental dissolution setup. It employs a transfer system with a 24 millimeter insert and a semi-permeable membrane at the bottom. This membrane um, divides the, 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 the well into two compartments. We have a donor compartment and a receptor compartment. The donor compartment is where we add the nasal suspension and um, represented by the blue dots. Um, this is where it dissolves. And then once dissolved, permeates through the membrane into the receptor compartment from where we sample and quantify those samples over time. Now, the very unique property about our experimental setup is that we're working with very low dissolution medium in comparison to conventional dissolution methods. And we think that this very limit, uh, fluid capacity limited condition better mimic the actual physiological condition in the nasal cavity. Now, let me just give you a, a quick overview over the study outline. The first step was to, um, to um, get the in vitro dissolution profiles by using the novel uh, experimental setup. And as a second step for the same formulation, we um, extracted the in vivo absorption profiles from uh, PK profiles that were already presented in literature. And then we drew a correlation between in vitro and in vivo and established a IVIVC model, which was uh, after that uh, validated internally and externally. Now, as I said, the first step was to generate the dissolution profile. And we did this for four commercially available nasal suspensions all of which were from the drug class of corticosteroids. In order to develop the IVIVC, we used the dissolution profiles of uh, fluticasone, propionate, budesonate, and mometasone furate nasal suspension. And later on, for the external validation of the IVIVC, we used the dissolution profile of triamcinolona cetonite nasal suspension. The results of the in vitro dissolution can be uh, observed here in figure three, which is a very traditional representation of the solution profiles with the y-axis representing the percent results and the x-axis representing the time. Now, for those three formulations that were, that were used for the development of the IVLC, we needed to know um, about the absorption profile, about the absorption behavior in the nose. And for that, um, we found, um, the plasma concentration time profile for nasal as well as IV administration in literature. And by applying a numerical deconvolution techniques, we were able to extract the absorption profiles 
as they are uh, as the results are presented here in uh, Figure Four. Now, the next step is then to draw a correlation between in vitro and in vivo, and this is what you see here in Figure Five. This is a graphical representation of the in vitro in vivo correlation. With the in vitro results uh, being represented on the x-axis and the in vivo results on the y-axis. Um, overall, the, 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 the data is described by a linear regression. And this linear regression is, is described by the equation here on the right-hand side, equation number one. And this is the actual IVIVC model. Now, what does this IVIVC model add? Well, if I only have in vitro dissolution profile of a corticosteroid nasal suspension, then I can use this equation and estimate what the corresponding in vivo absorption profile in vivo would look like. And actually, I can go one step further. By applying uh, convolution techniques, I can predict an entire PK profile. And this is what we did initially to uh, verify the internal validity of the IVIVC model. So by definition, that means we used those three uh, formulations, uh, those three um, uh, drugs, uh, fluticasone propionate, MF, and budesonide, and um, predicted by using the IVIVC model, predicted the PK profile. And this is what is observed uh, uh, here in figure six. These are the observed versus predicted plots with the, uh, with the lines representing the prediction um, prediction observed by the IVIVC model, and the dots are the observations that we obtained uh, from literature values. Now, this was the internal validation. Now, we also wanted to do the external validation. And by definition, that means we, we are using an, an in vitro dissolution profile that has not been used in the development of the IVIVC to check if the IVIVC is generalizable. So, we used, in our case, triumph syndrome of tonight nasal suspension, and by using the IVIVC equation plus uh, convolution techniques, we were able to um, predict the PK profile, which is here presented in Figure 7. Well, other than just uh, visually comparing the goodness of fit, I have calculated here on this slide, and uh, represented in this table, a more objective criteria to assess the prediction. So I calculated for each formulation and for the uh, PK parameters CMAX and AUC less the prediction error. So I'm not going to walk through the entire list now, but I will say that the average prediction error is lower than 10%, and not one single uh, prediction error was higher than 20%, which brings me right to the conclusion because according to the FDA guidance for industry for extended release oral dosage forms, it is stated that IVIVC predictability is established when the average prediction is lower than 10% and not one single uh, prediction error is higher than 20%. Now, the conclusion is the concentration time profile predicted by the IVIVC model adequately describes the observed data. And overall, this comment that uh, our novel transfer experimental setup is a discriminative method, an in vitro method that also closely reflects the behavior of drug absorption in vivo. And as a next step, I would like to use this um, correlation between in vitro dissolution rate and the expected in vivo absorption rate and implement this into a PVPK model, which I think will be helpful to make better predictions of the pharmacokinetics of inhaled drugs. And with this, um, I would like to end my talk. I thank you very much for your attention, and I will now be taking some questions. Hi, Simon. Uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, you know, I I really uh, think that this system that uh, you developed here, you talked about here, uh, quite novel and quite interesting results with the in vivo, in vitro, in vivo correlation. So great job. Um, so just with your dissolution system, I think all the drugs that you talked about here and you mentioned are the corticosteroids. Would this model, uh, the in vitro system, also be applicable to other classes of drugs that are delivered intranasal route? 
has that work been done by your group, or, or do you know about the applicability of this model? Thank you very much, Anissa, for this question. Um, at this point, um, the model is only developed and, I would say, validated for um, corticosteroids. Um, this is because of the physical chemical properties um, which all of those drugs have in common. So they are, for one, um, purely soluble, and they are lipophilic. I could imagine that for drugs um, of, of another drug class which exhibits the equivalent um, physical chemical properties like those two that I just mentioned, that I might imagine that we would receive uh, similar results. And other than that, if, um, if this would not be the case, um, we would even be able to um, make adjustments uh, to the in vitro system, like for example, adjusting the um, surfactant of the dissolution media, adjusting the, the solution volume, adjusting the pore size of the membrane, and then just really um, adjusting ourselves to whatever the drug class we are looking at. But I will say that not only uh, this, in this transfer system has not only been tested for nasal suspension so far, but our group and actually another group um, around May et al. has uh, validated the method for um, DPI and MDI formulation, so dry powder inhalers and metadose inhalers. But again, they were mainly looking at corticosteroids too. I hope this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Um, I think on that slide where you showed the in vitro profiles and that in, the in vivo profiles, the figure three and figure four, so in figure three, I guess you also re repeated the experiment a few times, so you can see the variability. And generally, it looks pretty tight, you know, uh, small error bars. How's the variability for the in vivo PK profiles for these nasal suspensions? Um, I cannot really speak to that because the, so we obtained those um, absorption profiles from literature, which was um, extracted from literature values. So. In most cases, we were actually working with um, average values. Okay. So I can oh. really speak to the variability in that case. Okay. Um, because I, I don't really know too much about this, but I was just thinking, um, since these are nasal suspensions, they have to be administered by, you know, uh, by, by oneself, I imagine that there might even be some errors, right, if someone is... Uh, administering the drug, they might have, they, like, they may not administer all the quantity of the drug, or some drug might be left in the cavity. There might be all these errors that could also lead to some variability. Uh, maybe I'm asking the question too early, but you said you would also be developing a PVPK model. So I was wondering, in that PVPK model, would you also account for these type of errors in the model? That is a very good question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, actually, understanding the systemic pharmacokinetics of nasally administered or also inhaled, like in general inhaled formulations, is, is more challenging than it is for some other routes. And that is because of the complex interplay between physiological parameters, formulation-related factors, and then patient-related factors, all of the stuff that you just uh, also mentioned, like for example, the spray angle or something of the nasal spray drips out or um, in what in which um, area of the nose the drug deposits. So these are all factors that, of course, cause a, a lot of variance. And um, this is why the aim of the work um, for developing the PVPK is to include all of those, um, let's call them the covariates, and then, you know, just um, being able to make a better prediction about what happens actually um, in the nasal PK. So yes, we are we are actually working on including all of those uh, factors that you just mentioned into the PVPK model. Thanks, Simon, and I'm sure that work will also be very interesting in the future. Uh, good luck with that. Looking forward to it. And uh, I'm sure as soon as you get off the plane, you might have many more emails from people in the audience who have more questions for you about this work. So congratulations again, and thank you. Thank you very much, Nisia. And I would be looking forward to any questions from the audience. Please email me.